Hey guys, Dan here with Dan Does Disney. We've got Tim here over the Zoom. Hello, Tim. Hey, How's it uh, going? We've got, uh, we're skipping one uh, this week. We talked about this briefly last week. Uh, Song of the South is uh, famously unavailable anywhere uh, through Disney. So I am uh, working on getting it via the internet uh, mailed to my house. Uh, but that has not happened yet. So we're skipping ahead, but it sort of makes sense because we're in this whole package film thing that Walt did in the 40s. So we're going to continue that with uh, Fun and Fancy Free, which I actually have on. It's a two-pack DVD, if you can see this. It's Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, uh, which turns out to be the final uh, like package movie of the 40s, and then Fun and Fancy Free, uh otherwise it's the it is available on dvd by itself but this is how i have it on the the blu-ray uh which looks spectacular by the way um this is the first one i think since dumbo i watched on blu-ray and uh it looks amazing um but like usual i'll uh, sort of give a, a brief synopsis of the history of the uh, movie and then Tim will tell us about uh, the features. This one, unlike the other ones, only has two. Yeah. Some of the other ones we've done have had, what would the last one have, 10? The, the, the release of it had 10, the DVD had nine. Right. Uh, but the Ichabod Crane one, I think, only has two as well. Yes, that also only has two. The next one in line is Melody Time. I'm not sure how many that has. I didn't really look. I think it's more like Make My Music, though. I think it's like a lot of them. Um, but these are t just two, uh, that take about 30, 35 minutes each. Um, and this was in 1947. This is the fourth of the package films. Cause of course you had the two, uh, Hispanic themed ones as well that we covered. Um, this took in 3.1 million at the box office. Uh, I could not figure out how much it costs budget wise, but most of these package ones have cost somewhere around 1.5 million. Um, so definitely re recouping his uh, money there. Um, so we'll get sort of more into the specifics of each short um, when we hear from Tim, but um, some of my buildup will have some plot developments and stuff going on. But so you've got Bongo and the uh, Mickey and the Beanstalk story. Uh, both were conceived in 1941 as full length films. Um, Bongo actually was meant to be a sequel to Dumbo originally, um, and they had, you know, because it's got a circus theme, which Tim will tell us about, but um, I guess he was one of Dumbo's friends or whatever, and he had a best friend that was a chimpanzee called Beverly, and then called Chimpy, and they came across a couple of bear cubs that were like the comic relief. All of that stuff went out the window um, when they decided to sort of trim it down to not quite short size, but you know, not feature length size. Um, and then as for Mickey and the Beanstalk, uh, up until Fantasia, Mickey was kind of not as popular as he once was. He was trailing in popularity to several of the Disney characters, several of the Warner Brothers characters, Popeye. Um, so that's partially why they did Sorcerer's Apprentice, which I didn't quite realize. Um, but that sort of brought it back to the, the forefront. And then uh, in 1941, these two animators came to Walt and said, hey, look, we've got the idea. Why don't we do a Jack and the Beanstalk riff, but have it be with Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. Walt was super pumped about that. Um, and that was originally going to be with Wind in the Willows, um, which Wind in the Willows ended up being with Ichabod and Mr. Toad. So they shuffled some things around once they determined this was not going to be a feature-length uh, film. But all of this stuff happened in 1941, uh, which is when the animator strike happened, which is when, you know, they got their foreign market cut off from World War II. So a lot of the things got shelved. We've talked about this in several of the other videos. Um, and these were two of the ideas that got shelved. So when everything kind of got back up and running, Walt was looking at everything and said, you know what, I feel like these are more um, short-related or package-related than full-length features, uh, and part of that was the animation style. He just looked at the animation and said, well, this isn't as inventive or as sophisticated as some of the stuff, you know, he was doing for the other things like Dumbo and Bambi at the time. Um, so, 
Uh, what else? Um, I mean, that's pretty much it for the buildup. I mean, it is the last time Walt Disney voiced uh, Mickey in any feature or short. Uh, he had been voicing Mickey since, you know, the original talkie cartoons of uh, Steamboat Willie and stuff, or Steamboat Mickey, whatever. Um, he did reprise it for the opening of the Mickey Mouse Club in the 50s, but this is the last time he ever recorded the voice on short. Uh, this is weird, too, Tim. He, I don't know if you saw this, but he recorded all the part, parts for Mickey in 1941. So this all just sat around both animation-wise and some of the voice work for years before they decided to actually do something with it and put it together. Um, and then the, the whole sort of wraparound with this movie is Jiminy Cricket, uh, who I didn't realize ever did anything except Pinocchio. Did you, were you aware that he was like... I was not aware of this. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen... Mickey and the Beanstalk before. Um, okay. But I've seen the other version. I was going to say, there's actually three other versions that we're going to talk about at the end when I get to the, the home media sort of stuff. But, um, okay, yes. So you probably watched the one from the 80s. I watched the one with uh, our good friend, uh, Sterling our, our friend Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was... That was, and I, was I watched the one that was uh, broadcast with Dumbo. Um, okay. That was then a different one. Oh, no, that was the one with Sterling Holloway. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and my mom recorded it, and that's the copy of Dumbo that I had growing up. We have we have all the, like, plastic, big plastic uh, VHSs wow. for almost all the Disney movies except for Dumbo because my mom – recorded it off the television when it aired one time. And it wasn't even like, like it had commercials in it either. It was Dumbo and then Mickey and the Beanstalk. It was probably from Disney Channel then. Yeah. Because that's back in the 80s, Disney Channel was a pay station, so they had no commercials. Um, but, okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. But yes, there's actually three other versions of this with different people um, doing the voiceover. Um but uh, one of the songs actually up front of this, uh, I'm a happy-go-lucky guy, which Jiminy Cricket sings, was meant for Pinocchio and got cut. So but I guess Walt still liked it enough and was like, let's do something with this. I don't know if that was part of the reasoning for putting Jiminy Cricket in this. But yeah, I had no idea that Cricket was in anything else. But, but I've always liked him. So I, I thought it was cool to su sort of yeah. see that wrap around. Um, but that's sort of the, the history of the movie. So let's, I uh, thought the, the sequences with, uh, or the opening sequence with Jimmy Cricket was probably the best animation of the movie as well. I agree. And I think that's, you know, that obviously wouldn't have been done when Walt made the decision to make these features. So he probably wanted to be like, all right, let's have a really good opening and then put Bongo on, which is very much. I mean, it's it's fine, but it's certainly not groundbreaking animation. No. Yeah. Uh, all right. So let's let's hear about it, Tim. Bongo, Jack Beanstalk, and just the movie as a whole. So uh, fun and fancy, fancy free. Um, it starts with a, a good catchy song there. Fun and fancy free. I thought was a good catchy song. I, um, it. Uh, I think does it transition to Jiminy singing a little bit of that, and then he goes into "I'm a happy, good, lucky guy." Uh, I believe, yeah, well, I'm a happy go lucky guy is the first, like, real song, yeah, like, after the yeah. title credits. Yeah, but I think Jimmy finishes singing um, Fun and Fancy Free. Yeah, when he's uh, floating down on the leaf or whatever. Yeah, and then, uh, so he paddles in on a, a leaf and then uh, sings I'm a happy go lucky guy, um, and it's obviously in the world of Pinocchio because um, the goldfish is there. I think you're in Name right. is Cleo, the Cleo the Goldfish. Yep. Um, though the cat, there's a cat in it, and that's not Pinocchio's cat. It's a different I, cat. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing, but then I looked closer. I was like, that's definitely not the Pinocchio cat. I think Pinocchio's cat's name is Figaro, possibly, yes. I think. And he's a nice cat. That This cat's not a nice cat. Right. Um, and uh, he stumbles into a, a a room and there's a 
a sad doll there and uh, a sad bear. And then he wants to cheer him up and he puts on a record. And the record happens to be the narration or the singing narration of Bongo the bear. And it's, uh, it's a musical story sung by Dinah Shore, our friend from... Yes. Uh, from our good uh, friend. My... Yeah, uh, from uh, the last one. Yeah. I forget what segment she did, but... Did she do... Um... She wasn't the Blue Bonnet one, right? No, oh, that was the Andrew Sisters. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forget which one she did. I think she but, did one of the real quick ones. One of the ones that was only like two or three minutes. Might have been the, the two silhouette ones. Oh, okay. Yeah, it might have been. Um, I'm so, going to look it up while you're going over Bongo. So anyway, the story of Bongo is about three bears. Not those three bears. Another three. <laughs> Correct. Um, a female bear, a male bear, and a circus bear. The circus bear is Bongo. Bongo is the star of the circus. He is um, a juggler. He rides a unicycle. He dives into a water sponge or something like that. Um, and and as a result, it makes sense that this would have been conceived as a Dumbo sequel. Yes. Like with the whole circus theme. It, it makes perfect sense yeah. at that in the story. The rest of and it doesn't are, really fit. You are correct. Dinah Shore sings the two silhouette song. Awesome. Uh, so even though he is a, the star of the show, he's also a prisoner of the circus. He is just, he does his act and then he gets caged up and then he does the same thing over and over again. Um, he uh, has this call of the wild in him. He wants to be free, uh, and at, somehow he escapes. Uh, the padlock's left unlocked, and he jumps from the train, and he is in the wilderness. And uh, he quickly finds out that the, his circus skills do not transfer to wilderness skills. He can't climb a tree, um, and uh, there is a... Uh, I want to say early versions of Chippendale, but it's like two chips. Yeah, it's de yeah, they're definitely sort of designed in the same manner. Yeah, um, that make fun of him because he can't climb the tree. Um, but he doesn't really care because he's free. And then Dinosaur sings uh, a song called uh, "Lazy Countryside," I believe it's called. And uh, but after all his laziness. It be quickly comes night and he's scared of all the loud bug noises and the the bird noises and the the howling noises and it starts raining and lightning and so he does not have a good first night in the wilderness and he wakes up and he is hungry and now he has to try to catch a fish um and this one section right here probably has this also has really good animation sequence uh when he's first trying to catch the fish and it's like yeah. you can see under the water and above the water that was i thought was groundbreaking in itself um but then it quickly moves on to traditional animation of him trying to catch fish i feel like walt has always been real good with water stuff like i feel like one of the true groundbreaking things of that original boring song that we first saw in make my music since they didn't have the koi's in there um like the water in that was was real cool looking yeah i feel like he's always is trying to push water in different ways yeah um but i thought that was probably the standout animation sequence of the sh two shorts besides the opening sequence um and at this point he makes a fool out of himself trying to catch this fish and but it catches the eye of the female bear named Lula Bear. Um, and uh, then we go into our next dinosaur song called uh, Too Good to Be True. And uh, this is kind of like uh, a dream sequence through, uh, I guess, a heart filled heaven um, of them trying to be with each other, but it's too good to be true. And they keep getting separated by little bear cupids and other things. I thought there was kind of clever animation there. Uh, and it was then, cute. What? It's cute. 
yeah, it was cute. Um, and then we get introduced to the third bear named Lockjaw. Um, and his little intro is kind of like a quick rap spoken thing that Dinosaur does. Um, and then he breaks up the love scene. And uh, at this point, we find out a fun fact about bears. I don't know if it's actual fact, but <laughs> fact for this short. And the fact is that bears, um, they say that they love each other by slapping each other on the face. Um, so what happens is uh, Lula Bear slaps Bongo, saying, hey, I like you, and expects a slap back. And when he, she doesn't get a slap back, tries to slap him again, saying, hey, man, I really like you. And he ducks, and she accidentally yeah, yeah. slaps Lockjaw, who's like, what? This bear loves me, oh! And then this is where we get our third song of the of the short, which is Say It With a Slap. And uh, this is where Bongo finds out that that's how bears say to love each other. And that makes him want to go back and try to slap Lula. Um, and then there's a showdown between him and Lockjaw. And uh, Lockjaw goes over a waterfall. And spoiler alert, somehow uh, Bongo is saved by his Fez hat that he continues to wear from his circus. Yep. And then he is, then he goes and slaps Lula Bear. And uh, that's basically the short. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't think it was that impressive. I actually was a little bored with it. Um, I thought the songs were pretty good. Um, for being a snooze fest for uh, the two silhouettes, um, <laughs> I thought I enjoyed these dinosaur songs a lot better than two silhouette songs. Okay, she's very uh, famous from back in the day. She has yeah. many, moments, I'm sure. Yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit of a boring story. There were some some interesting animation scenes that I liked. I did that war sequence. Um, and then something early on, I thought they did a really cool club thing, is when he was in his cage, um, the shadow of the bars fell across his, like, white pajamas, and it kind of looked like a prison jumpsuit. Yeah. I, thought that was, I thought that was clever as well. Um, and I really do think that those were two early versions of Chip and Dale, but there were two chips, and then they realized that maybe they should make one look different. Yeah. Yeah, so that is Bongo. Um, I, I feel like knowing now that um, it was designed to be a falling feature, I'm wondering how um, they would have incorporated sort of the Dumbo storyline in there. I'm wondering how the other two um, characters, like, would have, the, you know, the Bear Cubs would have been the comic relief. Like, I just felt this either, the way it was, was too long. I think it could have been cut down by, like, ten minutes. Or if they had fleshed it out a bunch more and made it into a feature, I think either of those might have been better. But as, like, a 35-minute standalone segment, uh, yeah, I, I just didn't think it was all that great. Yeah, I think if it was a feature, I think think it would have been completely different honestly i think yeah um, that's true. probably because true. they had like a, like a side character and stuff like that i think this is what they kind of they had the character of bongo and they just like what can we have him do and they're like he can fall in love yeah i guess that's true it, it probably would have been a completely different storyline if it was and there may have been a love interest but yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is what they sort of compromised with uh, by taking the other characters out. But yeah, I mean, other than a couple of interesting animation sequences, uh, and you're right, the songs were fine. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, when I compare it to some of the feature songs of the early days of Walt Disney, you know, the Snow White songs or um, the Black Crow song in uh, Dumbo, I find this all, like, all of these, you know, Make My Music and all, all the songs were very, very, like, 
stuck in the 1940s, like that classic, um, I don't know, songstress type of sound. Whereas I feel like songs of, you know, Snow White are, are more timeless and Pinocchio and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And like, yes, they're good songs, but I feel like there's better songs in this movie. The, the opening song with I'm a happy go lucky guy. Yeah. I like that one a lot. Um, so I feel like a couple of the songs in uh, Mickey and the Beanstalk are better songs as well. They're yeah. not, they're not Snow White caliber or anything like that, but they're definitely better songs than, it just, makes, it just makes it sound very dated. Like it's it's definitely of a time where I yeah. think songs that his his other features sing are are definitely more timeless. So at this point, we go back into the Jimmy Cricket um, in between story, um, and uh, the record stops, and uh, we pan over, and the sad doll and the sad bear are now in love so the bongo story worked for them and uh then jimmy finds an invite for a party across the way at um luana Patton's house who apparently is a famous person that i never heard of before um yeah. and uh so jimmy goes to investigate and he stands by the open window and we have the introduction of live act meets animation again um which is apparently the the disney kick right now um third movie in a row that we've had aspects of this um and uh i thought they did an okay job with it um but we have um a famous ventriloquist named Edgar Bergen. Um, yeah. Now, have you ever heard of Edgar Bergen before this? No. Okay. So Edgar Bergen is a very famous ventriloquist, like you said, from the radio days, which I don't know how you do ventriloquism well on the radio, but he did it. Um, but have you ever heard of Candace Bergen, who played Murphy Brown? Yes. That is his daughter. Okay. So, yeah, so that's how she got into the business. And in fact, I at first thought this little girl might have been Candace Bergen pretending to be this other actor, but uh, Candace Bergen was actually born like the the next year or something, so she wasn't alive yet. But uh, once we see Song of the South, you'll know Luanna Patton because she was in Song of the South. Oh, okay. So, act, so moviegoers at this time would have already known her from that. Got it. Yeah. Um, so he tells the story, um, of Mickey and the Beanstalk to both Luana and his two dummies that he has with him. Um, one's named Mortimer, um, and one's named Charlie. Um, and he tells a story about Happy Valley, which, where Mickey and the Beanstalk takes place. Um, and we start with, uh, a song, uh, and that one is uh, My What a Happy Day. Um, and that's sung by Anita Corden, um, mm -hmm. the Golden Harp as well. Um, so it's sung by the Golden Harp. And uh, so after that opening number, um, a dark shadow appears and steals the harp. Um, and then Happy Valley isn't so happy anymore. And uh, everything dries up. And uh, we get to see three poor farmers are played by Mickey, Donald, and Goofy. Uh, some fun things happen with the, this. Uh, there's, um, I always got a kick out of the, the slicing of the bread so thin that you can see through it. Yes, um, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the slicing of the bean in like six yeah. different portions. Yeah, um, Donald goes crazy, tries to kill the cow. Um, and then uh, we are cut off because i don't remember this section but it goes back to live action um and uh yeah i ask how they did that because obviously they didn't redo all the all the ventriloquism parts with sterling holloway no they i just had the narrator like, and, like uh a narrator and maybe they just went i forget what they did um did they did they have like little commentary in, in between like they did here because like 
as we're the audience are watching the animation sections in this version, the the Charlie McCarthy and the other dummy are like doing like Mystery Science Theater three thousand like bits. Yeah. Um, no, I they think edit that out completely. I think they edit that out, and maybe Sterling Holloway had like maybe a couple jokes in there or something like that. Okay. Um, and maybe um, they just cut there, and they maybe they had a title screen that came up, like that was like Mickey goes to sell the bean or something like that, or sell the cow, because um, that's what happens. Because um, the whole cut to live action was Mortimer. And Luana were both upset that Donald was trying to kill the cow. Um, and then uh, he explains that he doesn't kill the cow. Mickey goes to sell the cow. Um, well, I apparently, in, like, apparently in no version do they actually explain, like, how he got the beans. There was, like, a, a rough sketch of um, Queen Minnie selling him the beans but that never made it to animation so like and there was another another version where i forget what else happened but so there it was two, uh it was honest uh jack from that's what it was. Yeah. yeah but neither of those were ever fully realized so i don't think in any version it actually like fully explains no what he got the beans from no. which is weird um i did like that uh in the cutscene, you have a couple, like, both this one and another one later, you have images of, like, Jimmy Cricket listening to the story, and this one he's eating cake. Um, I thought that was a, a good use of the live action mixed with animation. Yeah. There. And that's really the only time we get that in, in this uh, whole movie. Yeah. Is, is those sort of interstitials. Yeah. Um, so... Now we have another song, and it's sung by Donald and Goofy. It's a really short song. It's uh, Eat Until I Die. Um, and they're setting up empty dishes. Um, and I thought this was a fun song as well. Um, yeah. They're just laying in a bunch of food that they're going to eat um, and pointing to empty dishes as they're expecting Mickey to come back with lots of money and food um, from selling the cow. Um, however, he sold the cow for magic beans. Um, which everybody knows because this is a Jack and Beanstalk story. <laughs> um, uh, Donald freaks out. Um, uh, the, the beans spill underneath the house, and uh, and they start to grow in the light of the full moon. Um, I never realized that that was a like, requirement for the beans to grow. I think this is the only one that... Yeah, I don't think that's a standard in the Jack and the Beanstalk story. But they mentioned it twice, so for, yeah, it's for pretty important in this Disney, particular version. Yeah, for this Disney version, definitely needed the full moon's light to grow those magic beans. Um, and then we have a, a instrumental scene where the the beanstalk grows. Um, it's filled with a lot of sight gags. It's very fun. Um, I always got a kick out of the this sequence um, growing up. Um, they awake in a, a giant world with a cat distance and they set out on a venture um there's a scene where they're on a boat made out of a leaf and i think it's a dragonfly or some type of bug is like bombing them like kind of like a jet because donald's making them upset um and i always got a kick out of uh there's a quick scene there where they're bailing out the the boat because it's filling out with water and he's there bailing water into the boat um it's it's like a two second gag but if you and it's really quick that you might not see it the first time but i always like that um they climb the stairs and they enter and there's a table full of giant food um a few quick sight gags i always got to kick out goofy with the jello um and then they find the harp and they tell the harp says that there's a giant there and they're like what a giant um and then we cut to the live act Again, um, this time is Jimmy Jiminy Cricket drinking from a straw, um, and uh, apparently this ventriloquist is really good with shadow puppets as well um, because he does quick shadow yeah. puppets. Um, and I actually thought it was a good transition from the giant um, shadow puppet to the actual giant. I thought that was a, a pretty good yeah, transition. Pretty um, and then we have 
Enter the Giant singing uh, Fee Fi Fo Fum, which is another classic uh, song, I feel like, from here. Um, and the Giant is played by Billy Gilbert, um, and the Giant's name is Willie. Um, basically, uh, he catches um, Donald Goofy, locks him into a chest, and uh, then uh, the harp um, sings another song, and that is In My Favorite Dream. Um, and she does that to put the giant to sleep so Mickey can steal the key um, and free his friends. Um, and then the rest of the movie plays out just like Jack and the Beanstalk. They get the heart back. They go down the um, Beanstalk and they cut it while the, the giant's escaping and the giant falls. And then we cut to live action. And, uh, and then at this point, the ending of the movie... Um, Mr. Bergen uh, tries to explain to one of his dummies, it's Mortimer, um, that the giant was, because he was upset that the giant fell to his death. Um, but he tries to explain to the dummy that the giant was just a figment of his imagination because it was just a story and it's in his head. Um, and then, lo and behold, the giant, Willie, shows up and he rips the roof off the, the, the room and uh, he's looking for the mouse. He, he's looking for Mickey Mouse. And, uh, and then Mr. Mormon, Mr. Uh, Bergen fall, uh, passes out and uh, it ends with the giant tiptoeing through Hollywood um, as Jimmy Cricket looks on. Um, Turns out it was real the whole time. It was real the whole time. Um, I actually thought that ending was pretty clever. I thought that was very cute and clever. Um, I thought it was the best use of the live action scenes. Um, and you had not seen, like, it. I assume in the Sterling Holloway version, they just cut to the, the titles. Yeah, I so. I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the, right. the Sterling Holloway version. Because, um, I mean, one, it was on a video cassette, and right. uh, that's, like, where I watched when I was sick when I was in elementary school. Um, so I don't remember how it ended. Um, I think it just, they, maybe they added a, a scene or maybe, I, I have no idea. Or maybe it was probably just a, probably text animation was like, and maybe. they live happy ever after, the end. Right. Um, I imagine that's probably what they added. They probably added a few text scenes. Yeah. Um, like fancy handwriting, kind of looked like a page of a storybook or something like that. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but I thought it was uh, the live action intermixed with the traditional hand drawn stuff. I mean, I thought it was cute and clever with Jimmy a few times, but I thought the last sequence was probably the best part of having the live action sequences in general. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think the whole... First of all, th this whole segment is was more entertaining to me than Bongo by a lot. Yes. Um, so that's number one. But yeah, number two, I, I thought the I, – I don't know. I don't know that they necessarily had to do the animation live-action hybrid. I know that was Disney's sort of thing at the time to try and incorporate that. But I think it would have been fine if, you know, say Jiminy got this invitation or whatever and just sort of like – went to the window and like looked in and he wasn't necessarily a part of it. Like, I don't know. It was the animation I didn't think was all that great compared to some of the live action meets animation stuff that Walt had done before. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as crisp. No. And so I, I feel like in that regard, it's like, why even do it then? It's okay to have, live action, you know, intermittently with animation, just not fused together, kind of like, I guess, Reluctant Dragon or, or something like that. Um, and I, I think they could have done that here, because I think the most interesting part of the live action stuff was, right, the ending, certainly. But I think there were definitely some some comic relief moments with the dummies. Um, yeah. So I don't know that they really needed Jiminy Cricket for the second half at all. No, they just I think they just wanted to tie it all together. Yeah, I'm I'm sure that's why. Um the one dummy, did he not remind you of like one of Jeff Dunham's puppets though? The the real stupid one, Mortimer. Mortimer? Yeah. Yeah. 
like I had heard of Charlie McCarthy before, um, just from you know being a fan of Candace Bergen and her, her family history, or whatever. But I di- I didn't know Mortimer. But as soon as he showed up on the screen, I was like, wow, that's like this is Jeff Dunham, and then he was really stupid. And that's sort of a brand. I, I feel Jeff like it was, almost, it was almost the same voice as well. It's, it really was. Like, I think if Edgar Bergen, I think Candace Bergen and her estate should sue Jeff Dunham because it's so clearly a ripoff. But I did think it was interesting that it, it is kind of like a little bit of a mystery science theater precursor as well. Yeah. Um, with sort of, you know, talking about the bits, like while the Mickey and the Beanstalk stuff is, is being seen by us the audience yeah so I, thought I thought that was, that, that was clever um yeah. i thought all the songs in the second one were a lot better than the songs in the first one well they're certainly more fun if nothing else and yeah. i i think that sort of yeah speaks to my point of like i think the dinosaur songs are, are fine for what they are i'm sure they were great in the 40s but they're so very of a time um and i think these are more classic disney type songs yeah uh, that that you know stand the test of time um and yeah I, I think it made this version a lot more fun and i think it, it explains why people are more familiar with the mickey and the beanstalk sto- well i mean obviously it's a classic story anyway but i think people are more familiar with this short much more than bongo well they also like you said there's three different versions out there well but so. i think that why? I think because it's more timeless, both in the story and the songs, than you know, releasing the fun, the bongo short over and over again. I just don't think it would have played as well with kids throughout the decades as the Mickey one does. Yeah. So, um, so all right, let's see. Uh, any other any other thoughts on the shorts themselves before we sort of talk about the movie on the whole? Um. No, I just thought uh, the the sequences with Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, um, I feel like this, I don't know, were there more shorts before this that had the three of them kind of like doing adventures together, like as a team? I think the couple other ones that there are came after this. I'm not positive, but like like Haunted Mansion, I think, uh, came after this. Like the one that they're trying to catch ghosts and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, that has um, to definitely be after this one. That's got to be after this, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, there might have been one other one that they were all three in together that was like a longer short. I mean, they've, they've all done the seven-minute shorts together. Yeah. But yeah, I think this was probably the first with all three of them in this type of length feature. But also, I felt like them as a team because they were all in that uh the short with the the band musical right that was a few years ago but but they weren't like a team working together i thought um the dynamic of them working together was done really well um and yeah i'm not sure if there are any shorts to this point where they're friends even just like the seven minute shorts i'm not sure yeah so Uh, i heard that aspect aspect and that kind of um reminded me of like the 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 ghost catching me too uh, short as well um so i like that aspect and i thought um all the sight gags they were really good like i haven't seen this movie in probably 20 years or something like that um so for maybe even more than that but i was like oh my god the jello scene or like um the the beanstalk growing scene of like them almost falling out the beanstalk and somehow the they keep getting caught by something or something like that and they're all still like rushing back from childhood yeah i was like oh my god i love this yeah that's cool yeah i'm not sure if i ever seen this i know i've seen um like mickey christmas carol i think was maybe in the 50s i'd seen that a bunch that was like a holiday favorite in my house but I'm not sure if I'd ever actually seen the Mickey and the Beanstalk bit until, like, in full until today. Okay. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I'd seen it, like, on different covers of, you know, packaged DVDs and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I I really thought it was quite enjoyable. And 
I wish Bongo was better because on the whole, like I feel like Mickey and the Beanstalk is like so superior. Like I would give that probably maybe like an A minus. Yeah. Whereas I would give Bongo like more of a C plus B minus. Like I just didn't yeah. think it was all that special. Yeah. Um, so on the whole, because of that, I would say Fun and Fancy Free for me gets a B. That's probably where I would put it as well. Um, but Mickey and the Beanstalk is a classic and if you haven't seen it watch it yeah you watch it on disney plus so it's readily available yep you can fast forward to the bongo one if you don't want to watch that one but i mean i think the bongo character is a good character i just kind of wish they gave him a better story yeah i really do wish they had either decided to flesh him out and make it a full length 90 well not back then i guess it was 73 75 minute feature or have him be the star of like several shorts because yeah. i would have seen that because i do like the character you're right but i just i didn't it was just such a run-of-the-mill story the songs were very average um so yeah i, I think there's different ways they could have handled it but uh, as far as this is concerned this uh, blu-ray that i have of it so basically um this actually as a whole has been released several times. And then Making the Beanstalk has been released, obviously, like we talked about several other times. So this was one of the early Disney VHS tapes. Fun Fancy Free came out in 1982 on VHS. Um, and then again in 97 on VHS and LaserDisc. 2000, it makes its DVD debut as part of the Gold Classic Collection. And then in 2014, they put it with Ichabod and Mr. Crane for, or Mr. Toad rather, for the, uh, the Blu-ray. And then uh, the Beanstalk, was released by itself you know those disney treasures dvds that i have that we found um the the other thing on um what, what was that the uh, victory through air power yeah uh mickey and the beanstalk was released by itself in 2004 on one of those as uh with this version the the edgar bergen version okay. um, in mickey mouse in color and then uh, on TV, we saw Bongo in 1955 in its own thing on The Wonderful World of Disney, but they replaced uh, Dinah Shore in that. They love replacing all the people. So it was actually Jiminy Cricket the whole time that did both the narrative and sang all the songs in Bongo oh. when in the 50s, which I, I'm not sure if that would have made the songs more timeless uh, or not. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting because it didn't say that they did all of Fun and Fancy Free. It just said they aired the bongo segment with Jiminy Cricket. So I don't know if it had the intro part to it or not. I imagine they would have to have the intro part because, like... I guess they would get him to tell the story to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Or with like. Not. I guess maybe not. You don't need it. You could have just had him, like, put on the record or, uh, or something you don't necessarily need like the song at the beginning and him floating down the river and, so i don't know if they had that or not um but that's such good animation it'd be a waste to cut that yeah that's true it wouldn't really make sense for them to cut it that's true um okay so then mickey and the main star here's all the different versions of that so in the uh 50s they had it on the wonderful world of disney as well um, and that was the first time that the Sterling Holloway narration existed. And then they re-released that um, in the 80s for this show called Good Morning Mickey. Uh, they had a Donald Duck 50th anniversary party on ABC. They did the Sterling Holloway there. Um, and then you have it alongside Dumbo um, in the 80s as well. But as far as I know, the Sterling Holloway version has never been released on anything. It's just the version that's best known on TV. Then there's another version that came out in the 60s um, with a cartoon character called Ludwig von Drake, who is a duck, and I think he's some sort of relation to Scrooge and Donald. Because um, I saw a picture of him, and he just looks like he's part of that family. Um, and then that version did come out um, as part of a favorite stories collection in the 90s on VHS. Um, and then there was a third version that aired in the 70s only with Shari Lewis and Lamb Chop, um, who I love from, from my childhood. Um, and that was part of the TV show, The Mouse Factory. Um, and I don't know if that was 
I mean, I imagine if they had her with Lamb Chop, it would they would have new live action segments in between the animated segments. But I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really find information on that. Yeah, I wonder if they could just kind of plug and play like the live action intermix with Jiminy Cricket easily. Can you do that? Or if Jiminy Cricket would have been part of it, but I think they they could have done just her and Lamb Chop, and maybe she was telling the story to a group of kids, like Edgar Bergen was telling it to a girl. I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting. I wonder if YouTube has anything like that. Um, but that leads me into this this Blu-ray collection because I would have loved if they had at least one of these other versions to compare and contrast as a bonus feature. Um, but alas, they don't. The only bonus feature on here, and granted, it is a pretty good one, um, is the full-length Reluctant Dragon movie. Not just the half-hour short, but the whole one um, that I guess you said they have it on Disney Plus in this version, right? The whole yep. hour I, I watched, 15 I watched minutes. Reluctant Dragon with all the pieces. Yeah. Um, so to my knowledge, this may be the first time Reluctant Dragon was released in full, certainly on Blu-ray, um, but I don't know if it was released in full on DVD either. I'm sure I said it when I did the review of it, but... Is, um, is this how you watch the Reluctant Dragon? No, because I didn't actually realize it was, it was on here. Um, I watched it on one of the Disney Treasures DVDs. Oh, yeah. no. It was, it was part of the, uh, I think it was part of the behind the scenes at Disney um, series. They had like two discs of that. Um, so I watched it that way. I, I sort of wish I watched it on this because this was so crisp. Like I said up top, um, I, was, I was blown away by how good this looked for something. Especially like the Edgar Bergen clips, which you have to figure have long been taken out of, of the thing. Um, I mean, I guess... When they've released Fun and Fancy Free in full on collections, the Edgar Bergen stuff had been intact. But, um, but one of the other things I really liked about this particular DVD is, or Blu-ray, is that it's in the original aspect ratio, which most of the things I've watched, even I think on Blu-ray, because I think I had three Cavalieros on Blu-ray, um, it, it filled up the whole widescreen. But I do appreciate when you can see something sort of in the original aspect ratio even though it's a smaller picture. Um, so I thought it was really cool that they did that. And for people that, you know, obviously this was before Disney Plus, this is a great spot to get Reluctant Dragon as well in full. So um, for that, I'll, I'll give the, the package a B. Um, and I guess I'll sort of review it again when we do Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Um, although I have that on a standalone DVD as well. So that may have different bonus features than, than this. I'm not sure. Um, but I would have loved to have seen the Sterling Holloway version or the Lamb Chop version or, or something yeah, uh, as part of that. But uh, alas, it was not to be. Um, but all right, that's uh, fun and fancy free. Um, I feel like even if I get Song of the South within the next week or two, I think we should probably just continue on with the last couple package movies. What, are, what do you think? We can do that, but the the order is oh, because then it's so dear to my heart. It goes melody time, then that movie I've never heard of, right? And then, Classic. Then, then Ichabod Crane and uh, um, Mr. Toad. But we can do those two and skip over so dear to my heart as well, and then come yeah, back. Yeah, maybe to maybe we'll do that because I feel like we're we're on this sort of journey with all the package movies of the forties. Um, and Ichabod and Mr. Toad is like October of 49, like right at the end of the 40s, that's it for the packages. And then we can go back and do um, Song of the South and, and Dear to My Heart. And then we start in with, you know, some of the some of the more biggies from the 50s and a lot more of the live action ones, too, that people have never heard of. A lot of like the Western ones. Um, what's yeah. the famous I mean, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is in there. Yeah. Um, First one is a, a Robin Hood one. Yeah, Robin Hood is one of the – I think the first one's actually Treasure Island and then Robin Hood. Oh, yeah, Treasure both, Island Robin Hood, yeah. Both of those are pretty famous live-action ones. So, um, And then by the end of the 50s, we get to some of the comedies, Shaggy Dog um, and, and some of those. So 
Uh, it'll be an interesting journey. But yeah, I think we'll we'll do Melody Time next, I think. Um, that is definitely the next order. <laughs> since, we're on, since we're on the package uh, trail here. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, all right. Well, Tim, thank you so much for joining as always. No problem. And, nice uh, yeah, of course. And we'll uh, see everybody next time. Bye.